Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Um, I've been asked uh, a lovely question uh, on <clears throat> being at work and dealing with someone who's displaying characteristics of a split personality, which is a which is a great uh, a great question. You know, one minute they can be really really nice, and the next minute they 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 can be grumpy, and uh, possibly tend to be overly nice when the manager's around and not so nice when the manager's not around or the director or whatever it may be. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it does remind me of myself uh, and uh, I used to, I had various jobs in the stock market. Uh, I think I worked in three different firms within the stock market and I was an addict at the time. So I was in um, food addiction, workalism, some other addictions, and um, I had very, um, I would say I would have um, uh, what would seem to be others split personality, because I was an addict. Uh, and as an addict, at a low vibration, a low uh, vibration or consciousness level, um, you're always feeling fear and you're sometimes run by these motives which, which can overtake you. But sometimes, and you usually have a very good persona, you know, to try and get what you want. Because as an addict, you're always feeling in lack. You know, you're always in this field of emptiness. But you become very, very good at trying to get the things that you think you need. Mm. You know, so you become very clever and very mm. manipulative. And, I, you know, I remember, um, uh, so yes, I would be, if I thought, people, you know, like in the job, I thought I needed certain people for my survival in that mm -hmm. job because it was very competitive. So obviously I'd be trying to be nice to the people who can help me. Yeah. I wasn't really interested in being nice to people yeah. who <laughs> can't help, if they were juniors, <laughs> if they were juniors or people who couldn't help me, I was yeah. not really interested at all because they, they, weren't, they weren't like anything relevant to my what I needed for survival, what mm. I wanted. Mm. Like I, I thought I needed to fill this empty hole, you know, I thought I needed food, I thought I needed success, you know, so I was very sort of success driven. So anything I would target, any people in the firm who I thought, obviously the manager, you know, when, when I, as an addict, you know, the, like the, you know, the, the authority figure, the one who can bestow things is like, that's the one you have to make happy. You know, and then there were people in the firm who had more knowledge than me. You know, and as I was new, I needed to also, you know, be nice to them, so that when I was stuck, I could go to them. You know, so I remember. So I would have this. You know, as and as an addict, it's very very extreme. So either you're putting on a show to try and like get people to like you or get what you want from people. And then if you, sometimes you have to revert because it's, it's like a lot of energy to keep this act up. So yeah. obviously sometimes if, when you can let your guard down, your true nature shows, you know, so then you could be grumpy or angry or not want to communicate. And people who were, um, people who are not relevant to getting what I wanted in that were totally not, not interesting to me. And I, I definitely wouldn't want to be friends with them or have small talk with them because they're just not relevant. I just want... In that place, survival and success, you know, in that one, <clears throat> to get, you know, to get a good, uh, to be in there for two years, get enough experience, then go into a better firm. Because I wasn't loyal to the firm, I just loyal, loyal to my ambitions, you see. So I remember, um, so on the first day I, uh, of a certain job, like the, um, I remember I, I just finished my MBA, the director said to me um, something like, he just said to me, like, I want four reports on these companies by next week. And there was no training, you know, it was like my first day. <laughs> it was like, and that was it. And then he left, you know, and it was like, I was, in, I was such a, an addict. It was like, um, my God, you know, you, you definitely can't ask him and show him you don't know anything. And uh, so that was it. So I wasn't going to touch him because I was scared of him as well for various reasons and uh, 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 but then there was like the um, there was like the I don't know what you'd call him the, the head of the, bro the brokers the head of the stock brokers and he was quite knowledgeable like on the Reuters terminal and all, all the various things 
So I just done my MBA and, and I needed to get this information. I didn't know how to use a Reuters terminal and how to access the information. Which, and some of the calculations, which are quite embarrassing, some of the basic calculations, I wasn't sure you know, where to get the numbers from and what to plug them in. So I was asking him really, like, I'd go up to him, I'd be really nice to him and say, like, yeah, how do I use the Reuters terminal? Which numbers again do I have to use, as if I knew them already, to plug in, to put on the reports? But, you know, as an addict, you know, what I, what I found was I was very... Addicts are very, very creative mm -hmm. in, in extremely, even if they haven't got a clue, they, they're very, very creative, you know, and I remember, so I was like, that, that did stand me in the way. Like I was ringing up, because I, you know, like, I'm not an expert on these four companies in the stock market, and how do you get four companies done in a week with no training and no one telling you what to do? So I had to make friends with the people I thought could help me. And, you know, to, to you know, they did. You know, they were very, very nice. So I was hoping, please help me do these, use the Reuters term, get the numbers, but don't tell the boss that I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. And they didn't, you know, they, they, I mean, they probably knew the, what kind of boss there was in that company. So they were kind of, but I didn't really like want to make friends with anyone who were juniors or anything. That wasn't on my radar at all. And, uh, and I did call up the, the, the way, this is a trick, you know, this is what, how creative. I, I phoned up all the other brokerages and all the other sort of investment banks who were covering those stocks and asked them to, at that time it was faxing. It wasn't so much emailing. It was, can you fax your reports? So I just got everyone's research reports from all the other brokerages. I got to use the terminals and I read all of the other reports on these stocks and I combined it all together. And at the end of the week, I just like, at the end of the week, I remember I just put these four reports on these four stocks onto it. I, I didn't, you know, I just had this quick work conversation with him on the first day. And then after a week on his desk, I landed four reports. And he was really, really happy. So I was very, very creative in that way. But yes, you know, as, as an addict, my default is very much, there's no, um, it's very much about getting what you want. Mm. There is no empathy or love, mm. or it's just you have a one track mind. Mm. And when, if there's somebody who can help you, then you'll suddenly switch into, the, you'll have all your creative faculties to make them like you, to get what you want from them. So, and as an addict, you, you know, people who are alcoholics or food addicts or have some kind of, they're often got like a split personality. Like if they want something from you, they can be very, very nice. As long as you've got, but if you, they no longer need you, mm. you know, the minute they no longer <coughs> need you, you know, then, you know, they can be quite horrible. Especially if, you, if they thought you could get something, they can't get something from you. And you probably will experience that. And they're, they're having to put on a show. That's not, when they're nice, that's not their genuine nature. So they can be very, very nice. I mean, they can also have split personalities depending on whether they're using or not. So if you remember um, uh, Ramana Maharishi and Muji sort of says, like, if you really, really want something, like say I want that girl, or I want that pint of alcohol, or I want that donut. You obsess about it, and when you get it, you go into a high for a short term. So if you've got them after a pint or so, you know they can be quite, you know, quite mellow, quite chilled out. But then they can crash down, mm. or they can be in an, ir ir you know, they can be mm. in an irritated thing. So they tend to be quite chaotic. Um, so in terms of, so generally, if they're you know, there can be things with, I mean, I think generally speaking, you're more likely to meet addicts. I mean, Hawkins did speak about, you know, real sort of people with multiple personalities where your eye colour can change and uh, you can be diabetic in one and non-diabetic. So you can have like really difficult ones. I think those are a bit more unusual. And then he talked a lot about the, uh, the spies, uh, the double agents who can often be, when they're in a certain role, you know, I guess if you're working for the CIA, mm -hmm. you know, when you're in that environment, you switch to this personality, which is very respectable and seems to do all the jobs really well and seems to be like a really nice family man. And as soon as you're out, you can split off into like, okay, let's sell these secrets. And, and they actually calibrate at different levels. Where I think if you've got an addict, um, they would calibrate at one level, but they're very good at switching. If they want something, they're going to be very nice. But when they don't need something, they can revert back to their thing. So I think something like, so 
I think generally the world is full of addicts. You're more likely to meet addicts. So they're very, very charismatic when they want something, but they're not really not that nice. It's only when they walk, you've got mm -hmm. something they want, but their calibration level is quite low. If you calibrate them, you'd probably calibrate them at 125, uh, and, and that would be it. And so, but, mm. but you'd perceive them as sometimes being very nice to some people and being very horrible. Yeah. But genuine split personalities, uh, I, as I understood it, you could calibrate them because they're genuine splits. So sometimes they can actually calibrate, like you might calibrate them at one point. Like while they're in the CI offices, you'd calibrate them and they'd be like 400. And then as soon as they're out of the CIA offices, you might calibrate them and they might be 70. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that's more rare. Uh, that's more rare. And, um, but, you know, what, what I've been getting into... Uh, a lot recently is that, um, and I've been watching a lot of Hawkins recently, and it's tying in. You know, I didn't really know pick up this stuff um, sort of when I first got into Hawkins. Is the the, the karmic nature of of the universe? Mm -hmm. You know, I really do like uh, Hawkins' anti karma prayer. Like, you know, he sort of mentioned like, you know, what was it? Um, someone knocked his knee. Someone knocked his knee and he, he, he checked with kinesiology. And uh, have I knocked someone else's knee in like in the past lifetime or something? And he came out, yes, you know. So I use the, uh, what I, I call it, the I've, I've named it the anti karma prayer. So I pray for forgiveness for the one in me who's uh, inflict, you know, inflicted damaged knees on others uh, in this lifetime, past lifetimes. So if I was to go into a job and I'd find someone who's who is um, sometimes nice when the boss is around, and then, or more sometimes nice to me, and then sometimes can switch and be very horrible. I'd probably try and, if you don't have access to kinesiology, just assume that I did that. I have been like that. And remember, you know, like I think he sort of, Hawkins sort of said, you know, we might have had you know, 15 to 25 past lifetimes, and in, Prior lifetimes, you know, we, you know, could have, I could have been like a caveman, like clubbing people, or, you know, or I could have been, you know, in one of the wars, you know, or I could have been a pirate, you know, uh, you know, like a rob, a rob, or, or a robber, you know, I was probably like a, a, a spiritual hat and scarf thief, you know, I found that my hats and scarves would go missing in spiritual venues, they just disappear. No one would know where they'd gone. You know, I remember going to a Course in Miracles group. Uh, yeah, I remember. I bought this uh, £40 hunter's cap from Selfridges. I wrote, you know, it was on sale. Yeah. You know, so I really got a good bargain in Selfridges, this lovely green hunter's cap, you know. And um, I went to a Course in Miracles group. And I was really proud, you know, I put this cap down. And it, like, disappeared. It just disappeared. And I asked the, the person, we all had to look around for this. And it just was just, uh, just seemed to have just vanished. I've had some of those things happen, like they just dematerialize, you know, it's really odd type stuff, but you know, but it happened, you know, in a few, few occasions, so I thought, you know, well, what's that, you know, have I ever, in a past lifetime, you know, take, so, yeah. so, um, and what I'd say, if you, you're in an office situation, you know, I think, um, you know, Dr. Hoponopono, uh, Dr. Hugh Lent, sorry, and the Hoponopono, <laughs> mixing up the words. Do he's, a, he's a doctor of Hopi, isn't he? He's got a PhD. Well, yes, now. exactly. He can be, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, the same thing. You know, the, the master of yeah. Hopi. But, yeah. you know, just to be able to clear the data, you know, because mm. it's manifesting, because I have certain, certain programs mm. or, mm. which are connecting me to certain fields of consciousness. And so it's, you could say, I sort of see it like the universe is giving me an opportunity to see in the world what I have been. Mm. and to release the data of my judgment of that data. So I think, you know, this is, this is just my, my interpretation, like for some reason it was great for Dr. Hugh Len to be presented with the data of a whole prison full of criminals to release, to release that data from himself and also free, you know, all those criminals became well and left the prison. But it just shows the power of, uh, mm -hmm. I sort of see it, you know, from the anti like, if someone's really bugging me, I've probably done that, I've probably been that way to mm -hmm. someone in this lifetime or a past lifetime. 
So, you know, it's like when the boss is around, I can be nice, but then I can be really horrible to the juniors. Yeah, and I think, I, you know, that's the kind of person I was as an addict, you know. If you could give me something, I'd be nice. But uh, otherwise, I think with juniors, I just wouldn't want to make friends with them because I, I have no genuine interest in them. Yeah. You know, like, what use is a junior to me having a friendship? Yeah. I don't want to say hello to them, you know, I don't want to make... I mean, they have no... there's no use, you know, it's like they're just irrelevant. So it'd be like, that's how I'd kind of see it. But with the boss, you know, I, I'd probably go out of my way to make him happy, you know, so that, you know, he can give me a promotion, he can do it, you know, I won't get sacked. You know, the juniors... <laughs> You know, it's like a waste of time. I'd see it like a waste of time. Or, or I might be competitive with people. If I thought the junior was a threat, then I'd feel a little bit angry towards them, really. <laughs> you know, I thought, God, there's a, there's a new young person in. He looks quite intelligent. And he, the boss might actually like him. I might actually be in competition. You know, in a year's time, this guy actually might be a serious threat to me. So... <laughs> If I started to have those thoughts with the new, I'd probably like give them a lot of anger. You know, I don't, I really don't like you being around here. You know, so I'd be thinking like that because everything's like a competitive chess field, you see. And and if there's a new sort of sh person who could be a threat to me, then I probably wouldn't like them. I'd probably become even more nice to the boss, you see, because it's like a competitive game. Yeah. I want to get what I want. I want to like harm the people that are, that are going to be in my way and make it more difficult for them uh, and uh, do all those things. So, but my, my thing would be then, if I'm in a work situation, is like, take, you know, I think the thing that Dr. Helen said is take 100% responsibility. You know, this radical responsibility that this cannot show up in my life, that I've got a colleague that is uh, displaying uh, nice and horrible qualities to me, you know, kind of... Uh, a multiple personality kind of kind of way or a addict kind of way um, by chance. So all I have to do is clear it. So how do I clear it? The anti-karma prayer, pray for forgiveness for the one in me who in this lifetime, past lifetimes, has been hot and cold uh, towards others or juniors um, uh, uh, in this lifetime, past lifetime. That's one way. I might, depending on how much it affects me, I sort of gauge, like, if something affects me a lot, 100 to 150 times, if it's moderate, maybe 30 times a day, or, or maybe uh, less than that. Um, that's one way. The other way to get detachment is the observer. The observer. So the way not to be affected by something is to practice being in the witnesser around that person. Or, um, so... I remember there's, uh, you know, and um, if you, you know, if you've got some kind of image or photo of them, you know, you can you can practice the witnesser on that, or you can just conjure up an image, or just pr pray for the willingness while you're in the office to just go into the witnesser, you know. So in the you so so <coughs> there's the because the ego is interested in whether they're nice or not, you see. Mm. So the ego's like trying to analyze the situation. Are they in a good mood now? Or are they like being in a horrible mood? So it's got, it's in, the ego is very interested in that character, you see. So the ego is not going to be detached. The ego is like going to be hyper vigilant, you know, like it's and nice stressed about it. and stressed about yes. it. So it could yeah. be like relief. So you're not going to, in the field of the ego, you're going to be in a, on a losing streak in a low level yeah. consciousness. So there's my ego trying to pay attention. Is he in a good mood? Is he in a bad mood? Uh, that's, so you want to go, well, what's witnessing? What's the witnesser of the ego? So, who, the witnesser is the interesting but what's witnessing the ego? Is the witnesser, so the witnesser of the ego, it, it could be an interested witnesser, mm -hmm. which still has some kind of, it still seems to be having some effect, whether he's in a good mood or a bad mood. Then I have to ask, well, is there a witnesser of the witnesser? Yeah. So is the witnesser of the witnesser, if I'm in the witnesser of the witnesser, when he's in the room. We're doing this while he's in the room, because he might be doing something, you know. So we can do this. Now, say he suddenly switches personalities. He's one minute is nice, or the boss walks out of the room and suddenly reverts to the other personality. You see, you, you just check whether he's now switched. Has there been any effect on you? 
And actually, if you go to the wit usually if you go to the witness or the witnesser, it doesn't really matter because the witness or the witnesser doesn't is not really paying attention to whether he goes he fluxes up and down. Mm. It's, it's only the ego pays a lot of attention, the interested observer pays less attention, and the detached observer just it doesn't affect the detached observer. So as you practice that while he's in the office, you'll find that whether he goes up or down, it'll have less and less effect on you. But also, I think there's a mystical, like why I worked with my mother, as you start doing these things, um, your level of consciousness goes up and you're actually resolving his karma, you see, through forgiveness, because we're all linked, you see. You know, I, I sometimes uh, think, you know, you know, possibly, with, um, you know, I've had problems with a neighbour uh, recently with my father's B&B property, you know, who knows, this could be someone that I've been a horrible neighbour to in a, in a past lifetime. So it might be, you know, he gets a chance to be horrible to me this time, mm -hmm. and if I can forgive him, then he might actually calm down and become, you know, uh, placate, mm -hmm. you know, so... I get the chance to, you know, sometimes these could be what the dynamics going on. So, you know, uh, you know, maybe in the, you know, I think these are helpful to me, you know, maybe in the last lifetime, you know, I was the boss and I was, a, or whatever, but, you know, just doing that, but you'll start through the observer. And my experience is like, when he has no effect on you whatsoever, I think nearly every time that's happened, and I know there's no effect, there's been some form of miracle. In some shape or form, something happens. Either the person becomes nice. I've had people mm. become nice when I fully release them, or sometimes God takes them out of the country. I had that with a, so I read about that in my book. I had a lady in a spiritual group who were kind of like, didn't like each other. And the day I felt I cleared it, I went in and she said, Oh, Sabir, you taught me a great spiritual lesson. I just let you know I'm leaving the country. And it was like, as it cleared, suddenly she had to leave the country. So God does something mystical. So, in that. Otherwise, you can do the Course in Miracles, which uh, I know some of you know about. Uh, pray for a miracle to seem differently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <clears throat> uh, God did not create a dual personality colleague, so it's not real. Um, uh, instead of this uh, changeable person, I could see peace. You know, um, and um, so there's various ones you can do. So I just use the whole lot. Also feel the feelings, which I talk about, or just letting go, as Hawkins says. So if you get an emotional charge, you know, you can sit with those feelings. Or you can let the feelings run in the office, you see. So you're just carrying on working. And if there's like an emotional fear or anger charge, just let that be without trying to re resist it or push it down. And that will start to, to, to release it. One of the things I did, which may not be practical, but one of the things I did... Uh, but I had an incentive. I might not have done this for a colleague with my mother. I always tried to do this thing of like, sh give them acts of love, you know, which maybe is not relevant in an office thing. But I did find um, that it would, in the begin early days, it would take me a long time to recover from, from what I call being hooked into something that disconnected me. Mm. But later it got lower and lower, and I would always like try to do the opposite of what my ego had done. After I'd recovered, I'd like offer a cup of tea. You know, uh, and I think eventually, I think that was powerful in a way because it's like, even though she, even though I felt disconnected, when I could, I would just offer an act of love, which was the opposite. Mm. And I think eventually, all those little acts of love did actually mm. filter through. Um, so it was like, mm. you know, because you know, it was the reverse. So I'd go from a place of like total disconnection, mm. do a lot of spiritual processing. And, and act, uh, offer a little symbol of love, but I didn't want it. All of it was to expect nothing back from them, and to have no expectation or outcome. They could stay the way. I wasn't like looking for a payoff, anyway. Like, whether they stayed that way or not, because I wanted to transcend that. There's nothing they can do that can affect me in any way. Um, so I do that nowadays. I sort of see if anything affects me. Try and take 100% responsibility. Maybe in some shape or form, um, the universe is showing me that I don't like these characteristics for a reason. And I just have to clear the data in me that's being affected. I often see that it also has an, often it will have an effect on the other person. But I'm not doing it to get the result. I'm just doing it to be immune to whatever they do. Mm.